Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series that's held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, also known as NCCWSC. They are located in Reston, Virginia. The NCCWSC's Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation. And this aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. Now I'd like to welcome Emily Fort, the Data and Information Coordinator from the NCCWSC, to introduce today's speakers. Emily, welcome. Thanks, Ashley, and welcome, everyone. So we have two speakers joining us today, Kristen Baum from joined Oklahoma State University in 2005 and is an associate professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. She earned a BS in Environmental Science from the College of William and Mary, an MS in Wildlife and Fishery Science from Texas A&M University, and a PhD in Entomology from Texas A&M University. Her research focuses on the effects of landscape structure and management practices on issues of conservation and management concern with an emphasis on landscape connectivity and pollinators. She's also actively involved with efforts preparing future STEM secondary teachers, promoting undergraduate research, and making science accessible to the general public. Elena Lopez Zozoya, main research interest, is to understand the impact of land use changes on biodiversity. She completed her PhD at the University of Yeda in Spain in 2001. She also earned an MS in zoology from the University of Barcelona in 2005, and an undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Navarra in 2002. In 2013, Elena joined Kristen Baum's research team at the Oklahoma State University. There she is participating in a project that analyzes the effect of habitat fragmentation on biodiversity across the south central U.S. Besides her collaboration at OSU, she is also currently working at the Department of Archaeology agriculture in Barcelona. And I'll turn it over to Elena and Kristen. Thanks. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Emily, for the presentation. My name is Elena. And today I will talk about the effect of uh, land use changes on biodiversity and connectivity in the southern Great Plains. Uh, just as a brief uh, introduction, uh, everybody knows that fermentation is a very intuitive concept that involves dividing something into a number of smaller pieces. In ecology, fragmentation implies the division of natural ecosystems into smaller patches as the result of human activities, such as the development of agriculture or urban areas in places once supporting forests or grasslands. Here in the image, uh, we see an area surrounding a town in Kansas called Pretty Prairie. It was named from its scenic setting up on the prairie, and as you can see now in the picture, that is, this is the picture of 2014, it's mainly surrounded by uh, agricultural crops. If we look uh, at the National Land Cover Database of 2011, we see that the patches of grassland that are left are small, most likely human altered, and they are highly isolated. In addition, the metrics that is this area that uh, is not grassland, is mainly composed of agriculture and urban areas. All these changes have an enormous effect on animal and plant uh, communities. This impact will depend on the ability of an organism to move through the landscape, its movement patterns within its habitat type, its response to path boundaries, and also to the composition and configuration of landscape elements. The concept that incorporates the species perception of the landscape is what is called functional connectivity, and it provides an ideal framework for evaluating connectivity across the landscape. The grasslands of the Great Plains are considered one of the most endangered ecosystems in North America and have undergone the greatest reduction in size of any other North American ecosystem. Only for like some data, I have collect uh, only 1% of the original tall raspberry preserve remains in the region. Between 60 and 70% of land in the eastern Great Plains has been directly cultivated. 
and nearly 30% in the western side of the Great Plain has been plowed. In addition to all these changes in the grassland, uh, the high demand of water for agriculture and human consumption has altered the majority of the water sources present in the Great Plains, including rivers, prairie streams, and wetlands. A recent article by Terry Sol and his colleagues allow us to have an idea of the future changes in land covers in the Great Plains. In their study, they built a model framework to analyze future land use changes in the Great Plains under four different landscape scenarios. Projections were derived from four storylines of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special, Special Report on Emission Scenarios, which are oriented along two axes, one focus on economic growth versus environmental protection, and the other one focused on global versus regional development. Also, they found that economically orientated scenarios were characterized by significant loss of natural land covers and expansion of agricultural and urban areas, whereas environmental scenarios, this is this B1 and B2, uh, experience modest decline in natural land covers to a slight increases. So in this study, in this project, uh, we have been mainly working uh, on three different ideas. Uh, and in this presentation, I will also present these three different ideas. First, I will talk about terrestrial vertebrate diversity in the Great Plains. Then uh, I will talk about a study we, we are conducting regarding the effect of future landscape changes for functional connectivity and metrics uh, permeability. And finally, I will also talk about a study uh, we have done using data uh, of the Oklahoma Breeding Bird Atlas in order to analyze the synergistic effect of climate and habitat fragmentation on the distribution of five different grassland obligate bird species. Let's focus on this first study. I will start with the first study. Here we analyze the vertebrate diversity in the Great Plains. And just as a short uh, and brief introduction of the topic, uh, we all know that the structure and composition of natural communities has changed as a consequence of human activities. Overall, there is a decline in the number of native specialist species which are replaced by a few generalist species and increase in the number of species associated with human activities. As a result of this process, biological communities are becoming more similar in space and time, and thus are more susceptible to future environmental changes. The thing is that most of the studies analyzing the effect of land use changes on biodiversity in the Great Plains have been focused on a specific factors, such as studying the effect of fire or wetland loss or survival encroachment, and have been also focused on um, specialist, some specialist species, such as the well-known lesser prey chicken or the prey dog, and most of them have been conducted at local or landscape scale. With this idea, what we did, um, and in order to have a better understanding on the effect of land use changes on biodiversity in the Great Plains, we analyzed the current trends across, across terrestrial vertebrate groups, such as mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds, uh, using a simple model of a species response to habitat loss and fragmentation. So, uh, here is our study area. We focus on the Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, this black that is limited by this black um, line. So this is within the Great Plains ecoregion. Um, and this area, the Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative, is an applied conservation partnership that provides scientific and decision support tools for the full complement of wildlife resources in the Great Plains geographical area. And we look, we look at all at the distribution of all North American vertebrate species that occur in, in this area of the GPLCC. A species distribution maps were obtained from a nature surf for amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, and BirdLife International for birds in June 2013. So here is our model 
that we use in this study. Uh, it's a very simple model, and the idea is that the species response to habitat loss and fragmentation depends mainly on two attributes, the habitat preference of the species and the species distribution range. The main idea under this model is that a species occurring in multiple habitats and widely distributed in the landscape is expected to respond less negatively to land use changes than a specialist species with a small geographical range. So with this in mind, uh, we, each species that occur in this area was assigned to broad habitat categories. And here we have some of the categories that we describe. We have the ones that are associated mainly with the prairie, the ones in the savanna, uh, also the, those species associated with a riparian habitat, and those associated with wetlands. These are uh, the kind of natural covers that occur in, in this area of the Great Plains. But we also have a species that do not have any uh, specific preference for prairie or savanna, but they occur uh, equally to these habitat types. And we also create a, a habitat category called grassland. And in the same way, we also create a, a category called we call water sources uh, species that are those species that select both or are associated with both riparian and wetland habitats. And finally, we also create another uh, habitat category. This is the multi-habitat species. That is those species that uh, select more than one of these habitat types. Uh, also, following our, and then secondly, following our estimate of the effect of habitat loss and fragmentation on vertebrate diversity, we classify a species as being widely or narrowly distributed in the, in the uh, study region. A species was considered to have a narrow distribution when most of its range in the GPLCC was included in a particular area that we call subregion. With this idea, we define four different subregions according to two major factors determining the species distribution. This is the temperature and precipitation. We choose the northern border of New Mexico and Oklahoma. Um, that reflects differences in the temperature to set up like a two different subregions of the north and south. And we also use the limit between the central mixed grass prairie and the short grass prairie region, this east and west, to divide the region into east-west subregions based on difference in precipitation. And then for each vertebrate group, we compare the frequency of a species occurrence in habitat categories using the G test of goodness of fit with Williams correction. And the same, we did the same also for the geographical uh, constraints analysis. Some results for, uh, of this study, uh, overall we detect 445 different vertebrate species occurring in the Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, in total, we detect 21 species of amphibians, 49 reptiles, 91 mammals, and 284 birds. The greatest species frequency occurred in the multi-habitat category, indicating a high proportion of generalist species in the region. A species related to natural communities in the Great Plains, this is those associated with water sources of grassland communities account for almost 25% of the species in both categories, highlighting also the importance of these habitats for overall biodiversity in the region. Also, in addition, almost 50% of the amphibians and reptiles and 5-6% of mammals and birds were classified as threatened at a state or federal level. There's also an important uh, point there. Regarding the results uh, of geographical constraints, we found that 42% of the vertebrate species occupying natural habitats had narrow distribution. It is were mostly concentrated at one of the subregions that we create. This percentage strongly vary across taxonomical groups, 
with 70% of the reptiles, 60% of the amphibians, 55% in case of the mammals, and almost 30 for bears. These results suggest that a large number of vertebrate species in the Great Plains have important geographical constraints when facing habitat loss and fragmentation, with this being the most critical for reptiles and the least for birds. Another interesting result uh, here is that when looking for patterns of uh, regional variation across taxonomic groups, we found differences according to species habitat preference. And here we have an example of the savanna species associated with savanna habitat. We found that in all cases, the species that were uh, narrowly distributed were, in all taxonomic groups, were concentrated in the south subregion. Some, uh, what we can say about this uh, study. First, one of the first things that we saw is that our results saw a wide variety of species groups according to habitat preference currently present in the area. The most common species in all taxonomic groups belong to the multi-habitat category suggesting that the number of generalist species has increased as a consequence of habitat loss and fragmentation, and the number of specialist species associated with natural habitats in the region has decreased. In this sense, and also in accordance with other studies conducted worldwide, uh, the replacement of large number of specialist species with relatively few genealogy species will likely produce a much more specially homogenized vertebrate diversity in the Great Plains. We also found that almost half of the species were associated with natural habitat had geographical constraints in the study area. This will be, it's important to take this into account when for instance, allocating resources and optimizing conservation action across the Great Plains. One idea could be to focus management efforts on those areas containing a greater richness of species with geographical constraints. And here we go to the second. Okay. Uh, here I will talk about uh, the study that we are conducting right now about the future changes, the effect of future land use changes in functional connectivity and matrix permeability for grassland species. Just as a, as a small intro to uh, what is going to happen and what is the effect of future land use changes on biodiversity. We don't know exactly, but what we really know, and this is something that is known for already 15 years, even more, is that land use and climate change have been identified as the most important drivers of biodiversity change by 2100. In particular, grassland ecosystems, and here I highlight the Great Plains, will be one of the most affected ecosystems in the world. In order to have a better understanding of the effect of future land use changes on biodiversity and also on connectivity, we investigate connectivity changes for species with different dispersal abilities using two IPCC SRE scenarios and land cover projections for 2011 and 2050. And we also evaluate changes in matrix permeability. So the study area here uh, cover the counties within the Great Plains ecoregion in Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. These results in a total of 261 counties with an average size of almost 2,800 square kilometers, and also like uh, approximately 90% of the counties are within 1,000 and 4,000 square kilometers. And we also see that the largest uh, counties are located in New Mexico. As I mentioned before, we used land cover projections of 2011 and 2050. This information on the maps are all available at this website if you want, whoever wants to use this uh, projection. 
we use two IPCC landscape scenarios, the A1B and B2. The main difference between these scenarios are that, for example, in A1B we expect a moderate population growth, whereas in B2 we expect a low population growth. In A1B we expect a very high economic growth versus a moderate growth in B2. Also in A1B we expect a strong biofuel demand, whereas the biofuel demand in B2 is lower. And also, finally, in A1B, we expect an overall loss of grassland cover, whereas in B2, we expect an increase of grassland due to restoration of natural land cover. And here uh, we have an example in Stillwater, Oklahoma, where the Oklahoma State University uh, is located. And here we have two different scenarios, the two different scenarios, the scenarios B2 and scenario A1B. Uh, in 2050. And we can see how the city uh, is expected to grow more under scenario B, A1B sorry, than scenario B2. And that occurs at expenses of losing grassland cover. As we see here, we have less grassland cover than here we have more kind of this uh, yellow, light yellow color. OK. Um, for terrestrial connectivity, to assess terrestrial connectivity, we uh, use the equivalent connected area index. This index is defined as the size of a single habitat patch that is maximally connected that will provide the same value of the probability of connectivity than the actual habitat pattern in the landscape. Some characteristic of this index is that, first, it has area units. So it's kind of easy to understand what the results is, is telling you. And also, it takes into account the connected area existing within habitat patches, the estimated dispersal flux between different uh, patches, and also the contribution of those patches that act as a stepping stone. And these three characteristics is what is, uh, is called or it's always incorporated when you are uh, studying functional connectivity. And again, here we have two examples of two species. The one in the left has a lower, we assume it has a lower dispersal distance than the one in the right. And then if we have for the same landscape, the value of the index will be lower uh, for the mouse than for the deer animal, for the large mammal. OK, this index is given by the following expression, where n is the number of grassland patches in each of the county, and ai and aj are the size of the patch, a and j. And this other parameter, this p uh, star parameter, uh, is the maximum product probability of dispersal between patch a and j. This parameter is calculated through the probability of dispersal. And how in this study uh, we have uh, used, uh, we have estimated the probability of dispersal through a decreasing exponential function of the edge to edge distance between patches. So let's, I think it's much clearer if we see this figure here in the, in the right. Uh, we see this decreasing exponential decreasing function uh, in the way that the probability of dispersal will be 1 uh, for adjacent polygons, and it will be 0 0.5 for the median dispersal distance of the species. For this species, we have here, for this example, assume a median dispersal distance of 1 kilometer. OK, so in this study, we select different, four different uh, dispers median dispersal distance of, in this case, 1, 5, 10, and 25 kilometers that broadly rep are representative of different groups of grassland species with different dispersal capabilities. And what we did here is to calculate this parameter of the ECA, that is the changes in connectivity between 2050 and 2011. 
And at the end, we also compare the relative variation in, in ECA index um, with the variation in the total area. This will give us an idea of the degree to which changes in connectivity will be influenced by changes in grassland cover. This is kind of uh, saying the effect of fragmentation per se. So how important is connectivity uh, without the effect of grassland uh, lost? For the second objective, uh, we build a cost to face based on land cover types. The resistance value were set by the degree of, of naturalness. So natural covers, mainly grassland, forest, and shrub, offer a low resistance to dispersal, whereas artificial covers involve a greater resistance. Urban areas have the greatest resistance value, with a 15 that we have assumed for this study, and are a barrier for dispersal. So the species won't go through a city, for instance. And afterwards, we calculate the difference between the median value of landscape resistance between 2050 and 2011 per each of the county in order also to analyze uh, potential changes in metrics permeability uh, in both scenarios, A1B and B2. Um, so here are some of the results. Here we see the changes in connectivity for species with different dispersal abilities from one kilometer here to 25 kilometers, and then according to projections of land covers in scenarios A, 1B, and B2. And what we see is the mean and the standard error for all the counties within each of the state. So the largest individual changes in connectivity were found for dispersal distance equal one kilometer. This is the largest changes in connectivity. And that value decreased as the dispersal distance increased. And also at the impact of landscape changes, also another result that we see here is that changes in terrestrial connectivity will be much larger under scenarios A1B than when we compare with changes in connectivity under scenarios B2. The impact of landscape change will be much larger also. In Oklahoma and Texas, look at these larger changes when compared with New Mexico. Uh, here, here in this other slide, we see the difference between changes in connectivity and changes in grassland cover, according here in for scenario A1B. This indicates the degree to which changes in connectivity will be influenced by changes in grassland cover. The results are displayed only for those counties with net grassland loss, which corresponds to, in this case for scenario A1B, corresponds to 99% of the counties we found there was a large difference between regions. In New Mexico, changes in connectivity were highly correlated with changes in grassland cover, and this was independent of the dispersal distance. This is why we see that in all cases and, in, and for all different species groups, uh, the difference between changes in connectivity and changes in grassland cover was equal or close to zero. Whereas in Oklahoma and Texas, the correlation between connectivity changes and grassland changes was high and increased with dispersal distance. Look at this kind of red and yellow uh, colors in several counties for a species with a dispersal distance of one when compared with those counties for a species with a larger dispersal distance. And here we have the other scenario, a scenario the same uh, kind of result. So this is looking at the changes between changes in connectivity and changes in grassland cover. But in this slide, we see uh, the results under scenario B2. 
Okay. Uh, in this case, 81% of the counties saw net grassland area loss compared with 99% of the counties and the vestinary area 1B. Although this difference, we see similar results as seen in scenario A1B. No difference in New Mexico and counties in Texas and Oklahoma where connectivity will be an important issue, especially at short, as, at short dispersal distance. And finally, we analyzed changes in metrics permeability for both scenarios. Here in the map, uh, we yellow indicate no change, orange means one level of increased resistance or more resistance to dispersal, brown indicate two level of increase, and blue indicate one level of decrease of resistance or less resistance to dispersal. Our results show that landscape scenarios have an effect of future changes in matrix permeability. The matrix will be less permeable in some counties in Oklahoma and Texas and under a scenario A1B. But it's also important to highlight here that a large proportion of the counties, that is 80% under scenario A1B and 94% under scenario B2, wouldn't suffer important changes in matrix permeability. So with all these results, uh, we have important, uh, came up with uh, important for points for the discussion. First, future land use changes are likely to continue threaten grassland habitats and species in the southern Great Plains. The effect on connectivity and biodiversity will depend on the scenario driving forces uh, such as demographic development, socioeconomic development and technological change. Under scenario A1B, the loss in connectivity and metrics permeability will be greater in Oklahoma in some counties in Oklahoma and Texas. Connectivity will increase in certain areas under scenario B2, although in other areas will continue decreasing. And species with low dispersal abilities will be the most affected by future landscape changes. So, Finally, this is the third study uh, that we have been working in this project. Uh, here I will talk about um, the effect of both climate and habitat fragmentation on a species distribution. So the main objective of this study was to investigate the synergistic effect of climate and fragmentation on the distribution of five grassland obligate bird species. Our hypothesis was that habitat fragmentation influenced the large-scale distribution of grassland bird species by limiting their occurrence in highly fragmented areas. A species data was derived from the Oklahoma Breeding Bird Atlas. In this atlas, over a period of five years, from 1997 to 2001, observers visit each of the 560 sampling blocks, recording all birds heard and or seen during the breeding season. For this study, we used the present and absence data of five grassland bird species that we know they are uh, specialists. One is the western meadowlark that occur in 33% of the, the atlas blocks. The eastern meadowlark that is more common and occurring in 90% of the blocks, the, the atlas blocks. Then the grasshopper sparrow in 65% of the blocks. The horn lark that is less common and occurring in 27% of the blocks. And the dixie seal that occur also is quite, kind of common as the eastern meadowlark and occurring in 90% of the atlas blocks. Um, and here we have our independent variables. For climate, we use two variables, average total precipitation and average mean temperature during the breeding season. Precipitation show an east-west gradient with more rain in the east and dry in the west. And temperature 
so a north-south gradient. And here we have the map for the temperature. And we see that um, lower temperatures in the north uh, than in the south. And for landscape variables, we use uh, the National Land Cover Database of 2001. And we calculate using FRAGSTAT uh, three variables, the percentage of grassland cover, path density, and, edge, and the edge density. The spatial pattern of the landscape variables in Oklahoma was not as clear as the climate as in the climate variables, but in general, the Oklahoma Breeding Bird Atlas blocks located in the east were more fragment, fragmented than those in the west. Uh, for the data analysis, um, we conduct general lineal models to investigate the effect of climate and habitat fragmentation. We use the present absence data of these five species as the response variable. So in a first step, we run models using climate variables only, considering all uh, possible combination of variables. This is for the climate, since we only have uh, two variables. This was for possible combination, one being only precipitation, another model being temperature, another, the third model being both precipitation and temperature variables, and the fourth model be, being none of, the, of these uh, variables. Um, the best candidate model was selected based on the Akaike information criteria, the IAC, with the best fitting model having the lowest IAC. And then in the second step, we add the landscape variables to the model, but retaining the climate variables identified by the best model from the first step. We additional Additional to these three landscape variables, we also uh, include the interaction between percentage of grassland cover and edge density. Since low edge densities occur in landscapes with either very low or very high habitat availability. And model selection was carried out using the IAC. And here we have a very simple example of the, here we have the Western Meadowlark and the two different steps with uh, climate first, and then we select, we conduct the different combinations, we select uh, the model has, that has lowest IAC, and then once we have the model, we um, add to the first model all the landscape variables and select also the best model based on the IAC. So we analyze Second, what we did is analyze the spatial autocorrelation of the residuals of the best candidate models for each species. Since the residuals were spatially autocorrelated and to avoid drawing erroneous conclusions about the effect of climate and landscape on a species distribution, we redefined the analysis by applying an eigenvector-based spatial filtering to take into account the spatial autocorrelation in the data. So the idea of this uh, methodology is that based on the geographic coordinates of the Oklahoma breeding bird atlas blocks and a principal coordinate analysis, um, a set of spatial filters, filters quantifying the spatial structure of the region at different spatial scales was generated for each of the species, of the five species. These filters were then used as predictor variables together with the climate and landscape variables selected from step two. So the resulting model, model was again checked for, checked for spatial autocorrelation of the residuals. Uh, for all species, the autocorrelation of the residuals after step three declined and was significant only at short distance classes, so in low spatial structure. And here we see the result of the analysis, analysis of um, the spatial autocorrelation of the residuals. We see the five different species. And here in red, we see 
the analysis of the residuals after step two. And here in blue, uh, we see the results once we have used the filters, the spatial filters. And we see how this uh, autocorrelation decrease at short cla distance classes. So we can follow with the analysis. Mm, OK, so in order to calculate the pure and share contribution of, of the three set of variables, the climate, landscape, and the spatial variables, uh, we use a, vari a variation partitioning approach, uh, the nagel kerke R square. So the idea, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, we have these three different sets of variables. Um, one way we have the climate variables, and then we have the landscape, and then we have the spatial filters. So with this um, parameter, we can calculate the relative importance of each uh, of the each of the each group of variables, but not only that, but also um, the part of the variation that is plain, it's only explained by those climate variables. The, the part of the variation that is only explained by the the landscape variables, this is the B parameter, and the part of the variation that is explained only by the spatial filters, but also the one shared by both set of variables also the ones here. So at the end, we have the entire um, variation explained by all these different pure and fair um, contribution of these three, three different set of variables. And finally, we calculate the area under the, the rope curve, the percentage of current correctly classified presence and the percentage of correctly classified absence. So we start with the results that I think the analysis, it was a little bit tough, but uh, the results were kind of more clearer, at least. So this is not surprising. Climate is an important driver of species distribution. Uh, in this case, for the species in Oklahoma, we found that the probability of occurrence of the western meadowlark, the grasshopper sparrow, and the horn lark was lower in areas with higher precipitation. And the, uh, so this is the precipitation, I'm sorry, I didn't explain the graph. This is the precipitation results, and this is the temperature results, and this is the probability of occurrence of each of the species. And here are the graphs for those species that have select significantly uh, one of these variables. So as I said before, what we found is that the probability of occurrence of the western meadowlark, the grasshopper sparrow, and the horn lark was uh, lower in areas with higher uh, precipitation. And the opposite occurred for the eastern meadowlark and the Texas hill. And in case for when we analyzed temperature, we also found that the probability of occurrence of the western meadowlark and the horn lark was lower in areas with higher temperature, and the opposite occur was true for the eastern meadowlark. What about the landscape variables? We found that all the species that we analyzed step the eastern meadowlark respond significantly to landscape variables. In this way, the probability of occurrence of the grasshopper sparrow and the horn lark and the seal increase in areas with low patch density. And we also found that four of the species are respond significantly to the interaction between its density and percentage of grassland uh, cover. And here we see uh, the results of the relative importance of climate and landscape. Uh, the, per the percentage of explained variation varies from 14 for the Dixie Seal to 68 for the Western Meadowlark. For three of the species here, the Western Meadowlark, the Eastern Meadowlark, and the Horn Lark, the variation explained by climate variables alone was much greater than explained by landscape variables alone. 
and the opposite occur for the grasshopper sparrow and the dixiesil. This means that the greater variation is explained by landscape variables alone than by climate variables alone. Also, for three other species, the western meadowlark, the grasshopper sparrow, and the eastern meadowlark, the largest contribution of this to explain variation was that of the share effect of climate and landscape with the spatial filters. These results indicate that both climate and landscape components have a strong spatial pattern that explains large part of the variation in the occurrence of grassland birds in Oklahoma. Uh, what about the accuracy of the models? Uh, we found that the classification accuracy was excellent for the western medullar, good for the grasshopper sparrow, this is the uh, AUC uh, index, uh, was excellent for the western meadowlark, good for the grasshopper sparrow, the eastern meadowlark, and the horn lark, and fair for the dixiesil. We also found that the percentage of currently classified presence, this is the sensitivity uh, parameter, uh, vary from 77 for the horn lark and the dixiesil. Uh, the Dixiesil to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for vary from 77% for the horn lark and the Dixiesil to uh, 94 for the western meadowlark. And the presence uh, percentage of currently classified absence, the specificity, was greater than 75% in all species except for the Dixiesil. And here, we, with these results, we also uh, came up with interesting uh, ideas for the discussion. So our results first support our initial hypothesis regarding the effect of habitat fragmentation on species distribu distribution at broad spatial scales. Uh, models we found that we saw that models containing information regarding the level of fragmentation were more parsimonious and predict better the occurrence of a species than a model containing only climate data. We also found that the total explain variation and the relative importance of climate and landscape fragmentation on a species distribution was species specific making it difficult to generalize the contribution of these drivers on a species distribution. We also found that the interaction between climate, habitat fragmentation, and geographic location were more important than the effect of landscape alone. These results highlight two main processes that are very important. On one hand, both climate and habitat fragmentation have a strong geographical component a strong spatial pattern that I have already explained in the introduction. And on the other hand, the variation explained by both climate and landscape variables indicate that the species occurrence is constrained by the interaction of both factors. This is especially important in the context of climate change and suggests that only a network of well-connected grassland habitat patches might alleviate the effect of climate change on grassland bird species. So now what? With all this idea that we have uh, been working during this project, some questions raised from the results, uh, and we want to share them with you. Uh, there is an overall lack of in some questions that we guide for future research. There is a lack of information regarding habitat preference of many species occurring in the Great Plains, mainly uh, amphibians, reptiles, but also mammals and birds. Um, we also need to know the level of, um, of species habitat specialization, whether they can use, for instance, other habitat types that are not very different in the structure of vegetation, such as some crops. Uh, we know also we need to know also what is the effect of land use changes on biotic homogenization. There is very few studies in the area that have addressed this issue. There is a general lack of information regarding species dispersal distance and also uh, how species are able to move through the landscape. Also another important question is 
is whether the connectivity of remaining habitat patches in the area is adequate to preserve biodiversity, and what are the, is the role of protected areas within this region for the protection of biodiversity. Uh, what is the effect of habitat fragmentation on species at larger spatial and temporal scales? And we also need uh, accurate information regarding a species distribution of many, many other species. Just two, uh, two more slides. Um, the results of shown in this presentation are part of a project that is funded by the South Central Climate Science Center. So thank you for letting us uh, doing research uh, on this topic. Uh, the project uh, title is uh, Terrestrial Connectivity Across the South Central United States, Implication for the Sustainability of Wildlife Population and Communities. Um, just the last one, thank you all for coming and for being there in this webinar and uh, for, for your attention. I hope uh, you can get some ideas for future research in the area. I will be, we, will, we will be glad to answer any questions you have now or otherwise I leave you our contact information and then if you want to send us an email, we will be glad to answer you at any time. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Elena. I just received an, like a, a question for one of the assistant, Tim Hatton, um, whether there is a report available. Uh, we are working right now in the final report, and we hope that in, in a couple of months we, uh, we have it and we have finished it, and it's available in the, I guess, in the website, Kristen, I guess, in the website of the South Central Climate Science Center? Uh, yes, I think everything will be posted there eventually. Okay. Excellent. And then just while we're waiting for anybody to type in, Kristen, did you have any comments that you wanted to make? I think Elena went into great deal uh, detail about everything, uh, but yeah, and certainly if people have questions about particular components um, prior to the final report being ready, we can provide some additional information you know, via email or, or in some other form. Excellent. Thank you. And then we did have one question come in that I'd like to share with you, and it says, um, how did you dis select the dispersal distances. Okay. Uh, so the idea of that study was to have like a different, so select like a couple of four uh, dispersal distances. So, so we have like a representative of different uh, species groups for like a kind of sort dispersal uh, species having a median dispersal distance of one kilometer through a larger species uh, that have a larger dispersal distance of 25 kilometers. So this was the idea more than uh, reading about specific species, uh, knowing the dispersal distance. Uh, rather than that, we select kind of a more uh, general approach. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you.